The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. This court, from recess, now sitting. Thank you. Please be seated. We're now ready for the rebuttal arguments. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, I would like to keep this very brief unless there are further questions. But a few points I think are worth emphasizing. Two factual points. Why not, considering suitable provision for finance, why not consider all sources of funding? And it's very clear on the record if one does that, then the state is meeting even the plaintiff's desired cost estimates. Secondly, that would include then the CAPERS money and all that other stuff. Could include all of that, Your Honor. All of it goes to support the enterprise of education in Kansas. So how then do you reconcile all these cuts in services and the problems that are articulated, particularly in that one Department of Education survey? I mean, if everybody's rolling in money, it seems like we wouldn't be having cuts. Your Honor, I don't know that we're suggesting everyone's rolling in money, but that the overall level of funding should be constitutionally sufficient. Why the districts make certain choices, I don't know. I don't know that that was demonstrated at trial. But certainly what the state is making sure of is that a significant amount of money continues to go to the districts. It's not as if they've dropped off a cliff here. The other problem with the evidence, as the Court is well aware and has pointed out, is this is such a moving target on so many levels. There's the money piece. There's what are the costs. The studies are outdated. There's the standards piece. We're talking about Common Core, No Child Left Behind, the waiver. It's a constantly moving target. And believe me, I've spent my life working with courts and being a lawyer. I love courts, but courts don't move that quickly. This is a moving target that changes all the time. The extreme hypotheticals that you could come up with on either side, give $100,000 BSAPP, I don't know why that wouldn't satisfy a constitutional standard, or stop schooling at sixth grade level. Well, my answer to that is that actually wouldn't be an Article VI problem. If it's anything, it's an Article I problem because it's not about funding. It's about the opportunity for improvement. But all those really show, I think, come back around to the point made that it's very difficult to find manageable standards. The court may be able to articulate standards, but can they actually be managed over time in this very complicated context? So with all due respect to my colleague, Mr. Root, what I think he calls constitutional interpretation here, I would call democratic process. That the way this is resolved is the people elect their representatives. They do their best. If the people disagree with the way things are being done, they have a remedy every two to four years to make their wishes known. Also, sort of as a concluding point that I'd make here, I think Justice Rosen hit the nail on the head. I read it as about 40 years or so of school finance litigation, and I just don't think there's any way under the plaintiff's view there is an end to that ever. It's just an ongoing process. The next time there's a recession and there's trouble with funding, we're back. Or there's some other need that's identified, the legislature sees it differently. And in fact, there is a salutary benefit, I believe, on democracy to encouraging interested parties, parents, students, the school districts, to go to the legislature and participate in the process, not to assume they can just come to court when they don't like the outcome of the legislative process. That dynamic and that incentive, in fact, undermines what perhaps used to be a more engaged debate on the part of the school districts in the legislature because they view the court as their resort. They don't have to win the argument in the legislature. They'll just come here. So unless the court has further questions, I would urge it to seriously, seriously consider, as I know it is, the clear standing problems in this case, the very serious question about justiciability, the wealth of facts and material in the record suggesting that what's going on may not be perfect, but it's not unconstitutional in terms of funding the Kansas school system, 
And lastly, certainly, that any remedy, if the court were ever to get that far, would have to be thought about very carefully and fully respectful of the separation of powers. Unless there are questions, I will. I do have one question. Did, did you raise the issue of legislative immunity below? In the sense of challenging the remedies that they sought, but, Your Honor, I don't know how we would in advance say we object to an unconstitutional remedy being ordered. We didn't know until the panel issued its opinion it was going to order the kind of thing that it did. And certainly one might assume a court finds a constitutional violation, it will declare it. I would not typically as a lawyer assume that it would then go further and order an unconstitutional remedy to fix the problem. So your answer is no? No, I don't think specifically as, say, an affirmative defense, you cannot order an unconstitutional remedy. I don't think we said that. Counsel, one quick question. And you may not be familiar with the statute, so I'll give you the, the gist of it. It's case A7264B03. No. Uh, in, in D of that statute uh, talks about the remedies that are available. And it says a preliminary decision or a final decision in which a statute or legislative enactment of this state has been held unconstitutional as a violation of Article 6 of the Kansas Constitution, the judicial panel or any master or any other person appointed by the panel to hear this uh, has limited remedies. For example, it says, shall not have the authority to order a school district or any attendance center within a school district to be closed or enjoin the use of all statutes related to the distribution of funds for public education. Uh, as I understand it, that statute is still on the books. And my question is, uh, why would the legislature pass this provision dealing with the unconstitutionality of a statute or legislative enactment under Article 6 if there was not standing? Well, for one thing, the legislature is not composed of lawyers, by and large, and it was familiar with the 40 years, or at least at that point, 30 years of litigation that had taken place, uh, and may have assumed, because the courts had been deciding these cases, that the court could and should, or at least not maybe should would be too strong, but could and might have the power to decide these cases. But as we've argued and pointed out in the briefs this time, the court has never actually addressed standing, and I, I don't know that it would be fair to expect lay legislatures, legislators, which by and large most of them are, to understand, well, even though we've been through rounds of litigation, that can never happen to us again. So in fairness to them, I would guess, and I'm just speculating, that they were relying on the fact that these cases had come up, so they thought they were potentially subject to them again. So you would not regard that as any kind of a binding admission against interest on the legislature? Not at all. And I don't think it would matter even if they thought it was. If it truly is a non-justiciable question and there's no standing, those are jurisdictional issues that the court has an obligation to say, this is not appropriate for us. You, your honors are familiar with an example of the legislature trying to give the court a decision that the court said we can't make. That would be the uh, Morrison versus Sebelia case a few years ago, where the legislature said we want an opinion from the court, and the court said we cannot give it to you. So your own jurisdictional limitations, even if there was an admission or a waiver or a suggestion the court should do it, would still control. And I don't think the legislature intended that to be a waiver or a admission. And given your knowledge of constitutional law, could you express an opinion on the constitutionality of the latter part of subsection D, which prohibits the courts from ordering a school district or any attendance center to be closed or to enjoin the use of all statutes related to the distribution of funds for public education? Well, I think that's an unusual provision, Your Honor. Uh, I, I don't know uh, that the legislature couldn't do it. Obviously, the legislature does at times limit remedies available in a variety of cases. I mean, the $250,000 non-economic cap is an example of that. Uh, I would say at some point uh, a legislature might go too far. I'm not saying this is it in telling a court what it couldn't do. Uh, for example, saying any plaintiff injured in a tort suit cannot recover a dime. 
No court shall award damages. That, of course, would raise Section 18, other kinds of, of questions and challenges. Uh, I will say the courts in joining executive officials from enforcing laws has been a traditional and typical remedy available to the courts. Uh, so my argument this morning was certainly not about that statute, but premised on the idea of enjoining legislators or the legislature. Uh, but that said, if the legislature can limit remedies in some settings, they may have the ability to impose such a limitation as exists in that statute, although I don't think, at this point at least, I don't understand the plaintiffs to be challenging the constitutionality of that statute. Well, we were talking this morning about the separation of powers issue, and I just wanted your professional opinion on that statute. I, I think it, it raises perhaps some arguments about the scope of how far a legislature could go in limiting powers that, say, the courts have traditionally exercised. I mean, this doesn't come up a lot, but it can come up when legislatures try to direct courts in particular ways. On the other hand, they limit courts' jurisdiction with regularity in a variety of circumstances. So I could see arguments certainly on both sides about an ability to engage in such regulation. Thank you, counsel. Any further questions of counsel? Any further presentation? No, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. With regard to the uh, admissions against interest, we would add the notice provision and the procedure that was set up by the legislature uh, with regard to these cases on how they access the courts as a, another example of what the uh, legislature has done that would indicate that they acknowledge um, standing in this, in this case. Um, with provision for the three-judge panel versus a regular district court judge? Yes, and uh, they, they have a notice provision. I can't remember the site, but it's like 12105B that uh, says, and we did, uh, 180 days before you've got to, before you file a lawsuit, you've got to uh, lay out what your case is, and we did that. Um, one other thing I'd like to remark, follow up uh, Professor McAllister's remarks with, with regard to the closing of the schools, we did uh, challenge the constitutionality of that. We do think it is a violation of the separation of powers. Uh, it, even if the court doesn't find that, um, we think the court has the ability to, to uh, indicate what the funding should be and to order that. The money is in the checkbook. Uh, it may be that there are other state agencies that uh, have to make their case, but uh, there's no question that this court, given Article 6, Section 6 language and your interpretations, have the ability to do that. I want to address two quick things. First, with regard to the question, why not include other dollars? Uh, the notion of capers and bond and interest and the federal dollars, the ARA dollars that were infused about the same time as the Montoy money has now completely disappeared. And that money is unreliable. It is the state's obligation in Article uh, 6 to provide uh, suitable uh, funding. And that's what the statute says. To the extent we look at other dollars available, uh, we have to also keep in mind what is being delivered in the classroom. And our evidence and the evidence of the trial court was what money was actually being delivered for education to kids. And uh, that's what we would ask the court uh, to focus on. Uh, in in um, listening to the court's questions, I want to make sure that I leave the court with this, uh, uh, with this comment. And that is that on the issue of justiciability, uh, I don't think it is difficult to answer the question, is it manageable? It is manageable. The question is, what does the actual cost of education, including the inputs uh, and the outcomes, and are we achieving a suitable education with that cost? And you can measure that. Now, 
Admittedly, the measuring stick may change over time, but I don't think we, we death responsibility for deciding cases because the facts are going to change. But the measuring stick is what the legislature has said it is, and that's the rose factors, accreditation, uh, AYP, common core. And that's what you look at. Uh, it is, it is, um, uh, it is not a difficult process to manage. Now, will I be back here again in seven years? Uh, the answer is, if the legislature does what they said they were going to do when they were here in front of Montoy and provide a plan that provides for a suitable education and achieves uh, that with the actual costs, then I'm not going to be back here. But the problem is, what the legislature has said, in their own words, they didn't do. You can manage this without uh, a, a moving target, because what you need to do is simply do what the legislature didn't do in Montoy, and that is to do what you're going to say after you say what you're going to do. And they didn't do it. There's a difference, though, in that the evidence before us is what happened in the past, and you're asking for a remedy that looks to what the legislature might do in the future. Um, how do we handle that in terms of a justiciability problem? We, we have clearly said we cannot direct future legislative action at, when we're outside of a remedy stage. And this is a little different than Montoy because we're not saying that there are defects in the formula. We're talking solely about the amount of the funding. Well, well, I don't see the analysis of talking about defects in the formula any different than what we're saying here because the defects in the formula and what we're saying here by not funding the formula are both part of the notion of suitable provision for finance because this court in Montoy 2 not in the remedy phase, in Montoy 2 said you look to the level of funding which meets the constitutional requirement that the legislature shall provide for intellectual, educational, vocational, scientific improvement, establishing and maintaining schools. So I, I don't see those as two separate. We're here on a constitutional claim that they aren't living up to what Article 6, as interpreted by Montoy, said they needed to do. And they told you they were going to do it, and they backed away from it. And we're asking you to hold them to what their standards are today in terms of what they define as a suitable education and pay the actual cost. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Any further presentation? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We thank all counsel for their arguments this morning and this afternoon. The court will take this matter under advisement. This time court is adjourned.